Welcome everybody to Radical Civility. My name is Ben Piccini. Um, today we are talking about a, a sensitive topic. So you might, if there are uh, young ears around, you might want to pause this and, and, and listen to it when there are headphones in. I'll do a couple of other quick uh, announcements and then I'll, I'll jump into some disclaimers. So number one, you might be able to hear that my microphone is not working right now, so I'm using my webcam. And it's fine, but it just makes me sound like I'm in a box. So I hope that you're able to hear. If you can't, then give me some feedback. Um, but we're, I'm going to try and fix that up as quick as I can. Number two, Public Square started sponsoring a few different podcasts. I'm really thrilled about this. So there are three or four, um, and one of them are my dear friends, Carl and Liz, over at Pop Culture at the Apricot Tree. I've been on this podcast a few times myself. It's really, really fun. Um, highly recommend you check them out and the other Public Square media podcasts as well. Okay, now hopefully you've had a chance to hit pause if you would like to. Um, we're going to be talking about assault on college campuses, specifically sexual assault. Um, <clears throat> this is a very uh, sensitive issue, and I, I want to make sure that, that I'm framing this the right way. So the first thing I would say is the purpose of the podcast is to have hard conversations well. And so that's something you've probably heard me say a lot. In fact, I, I asked a, a buddy of mine to listen to the, the, the recording um, before it was published, and they said, yeah, I have one bit of feedback. You apologized a lot. And I actually thought that was good feedback because I tend to do that when I'm when I'm you know dancing around a little bit on a sensitive topic. So I apologize for apologizing too much. Um, the reason is because I want to get this right. I think it's important, and it's it's important to say things clearly and carefully. Um, and so you'll you'll hear some of that. The one of the things that one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about this though is because when Jacob Mayberry is is my buddy, when he published this article, there were calls for him to retract it. And uh, when I, you know, I reached out to a couple of people, I wasn't able to find everybody, but I tried to reach out to people who had called for his retraction to say, hey, if you've got anything substantive, like if his data is wrong, if you have other data sets, if there's other evidence that I'm not seeing, send it along. Like, I'm very open to that. Um, nobody responded of all the people that I reached out to. And so, like, if, if there is substantive stuff, like, my email address is easy to find. Shoot it over to me. Um, but if the frustration is because it doesn't match your narrative, that's something I'm going to push back against. Um, that's something where I'm going to have to say like, Hey, we're trying the best we can to read the data as clearly as we can. Now, by the way, the data is hard, right? When it comes to assault data, um, the reality is a lot of it is self-reported. A lot of it has, has issues. There are lots of limitations around the data. Um, on the other hand, um, when I looked at this a few years ago, all of the data that I found basically said the same story, which is yes, no, nowhere is perfect. And CES schools are no exception. So, um, there are people who go through real, real bad stuff, even in, safest places, even in places like BYU and BYU Idaho. And we need to be really honest about that. I personally had to walk a student to Title IX. And that's not fun, and I will not be happy or satisfied until that number is zero. And that's something I feel very, very strongly about. At the same time, if there are things that we are doing here that can work in other places, those are things that we should be talking about. And the narrative right now is that, you know, the, the church schools are as bad as or worse than other schools, and that is just not borne out by any of the data that I have. There, there is something going right at our schools that is really exciting that we should be telling the story about without patting ourselves on the back, right? Like if, if we were doing poorly, we should have that conversation, figure out how we can do better. But the evidence seems to be that things are going well. And that's the conversation we want to have is like, why is the narrative this way? What evidence do we have? What are the problems with the data? And what can we learn from this? So if you disagree, that's totally fine. Um, reach out to me. If you have other data or something substantive that you want to add to this, that's fantastic. Um, but aside from that, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Like I said, the, the purpose of this podcast is to have hard conversations well. Let us know if we don't live up to that. God bless, and, and I hope you enjoy the, the podcast. Welcome to Radical Civility. My name is Ben Piccini, and today on the program, we have Jacob Mayberry, um, and I will actually let you introduce yourself if you want to give a little background real quick. Yeah, I'm Jacob Mayberry. I am a corrections officer at the Utah State Prison. I got my degree in psychology from BYU. I also got um, 
my, my master's degree in criminal justice from Liberty University online while I was working in the prison and I'm currently working on my PhD in the same field. Um, I'm from Arizona and I, I plan on kind of working my way up the hierarchy here at the prison, uh, maybe become a case manager for the inmates. But I've, I've done uh, a fair amount of research in the area of sexual assault, how to measure sexual assault rates, how to measure crime. Those are the things that I've gone over in my master's and PhD program. And so I tried to apply that to what we know about sexual assaults in the church. And so I've tried to look at all data sources on that, on, on abuse and, and sexual assault in the church at BYU. And then I, I kind of summarized that in the article. Um, do you want me to go over the article or do you want to talk? No, that more? was perfect. I was about to say you wrote an article and things got mm -hmm. spicy. And uh, I saw people calling for retractions on, on Twitter, which, you know, uh, that, that means you must have said something, right? Right. Like that. Was, yeah. Why don't you why don't you give the, the thrust of the article and I will link to the article in the show notes um, and then we'll kind of go and, and talk to about the, the reaction to it. Yeah. So uh, when I first submitted my article to Public Square, um, it was a lot simpler, uh, probably less eloquent than the final product. But it was basically basically here are um, here's two camp campus climate surveys that have been conducted in the past few years showing that. Uh, sexual assault is much lower at BYU than at other universities when you compare them to other campus climate surveys. And if you have a problem with the survey, if you think everyone in the survey is lying or, or whatever, then, then here are a list of um, risk factors that increase sexual assaults that the CDC gives. Here's a list of them, uh, individual and, and family risk factors, uh, community risk factors, and then here are a bunch of data sources showing how members of the church, especially young adults and teenagers, how they fare on those risk factors. And if you go down by them one by one, uh, LDS youth and young adults fare very well, uh, especially in the alcohol and drug use uh, domains, which I think is what mainly explains it. But there's other other um, explanatory factors as well. And how did people take that article? So in, in fact, I believe that your your title was we, we actually know some things about how to reduce sexual assault and mm -hmm. the secret is happening. I mean, it's out. It's at BYU. It's at the church schools. Um, how do people respond to that? So the the comments that I saw on Twitter by some I won't name the individuals, but uh, they they attacked more of the peripheral parts of my article that weren't central to my argument. Because uh, I, I started out by showing that consent education, there isn't a lot of good evidence to show that it works. And they, the source that I used was just one survey showing that um, in places where consent education is taking place, there really isn't a reduction in sexual assault. And the, some people on Twitter rightly showed that that's not like amazing evidence showing that it doesn't work. And my goal wasn't to necessarily do a takedown of consent education, but just to show that the evidence that we do have shows that it's unclear that it does work. And that the main reason why they're being promoted is because people just like the idea of it rather than because it actually works or that there's evidence that it does work. So I just want to state back to you what, what I'm hearing, and then you can correct me if I'm getting it wrong. I, I don't have a problem with, with consent-based education, I think, but there, that might actually be me neither. That, that might be a great way to go about it. And to be clear, it, I, I, I would articulate it this way. Um, I think consent in my mind might be a little bit too simple, right? Mm -hmm. It might be not enough, but there's nothing wrong with the idea of consent matters and you don't get to do something without somebody else's consent. That, that to me seems like universal and rather obvious. Um, the shifting gears though, from a moral, what, sh how should we do this to, does it work like an economist or a statistician would? That's a totally separate issue where it's like, listen, I'm sorry if you really like dare in schools, drug abuse, resistance, education, but like the reviews of the literature, I'll say that it really hasn't made much of an impact. And this has been repeatedly shown. I, I had a great experience. I love dare, right? Or officer, what's his face, right? That That's a different question than does it work? And what I'm hearing you say is that there just isn't any uh, any empirical evidence right now that consent-based education is making the kind of difference that that its proponents are claiming that it will. Yeah, the best we have is that survey that I showed in that in that article, which doesn't like show a lot of clear evidence either way. But like again, I'm not trying to do a takedown of consent education, and we have much better evidence showing that there are other things that work, 
like what is happening at BYU and what is happening at the church. Um, uh, another thing about consent is that the only criticism that I got that was actually criticizing the surveys, the campus climate surveys, was that uh, rather than asking all of the respondents to ask behaviorally specific questions about different types of sexual assault, it asked a screener question. Um, and then it asked behavior specific questions to the people who asked yes, who answered yes to that screener question. Um, he, he basically argued that the campus climate survey wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have been included in the review that I cited of other campus climate surveys at other universities because of these pro problems within the survey. Um, I looked at the review that I cited in the article and it didn't necessarily have a problem with screener questions themselves. It was the type of screener questions. Like for example, it critiqued to the national uh, the National Victimization Survey, the Criminal National Victimization Survey for asking a screener question, but the screener question included words like rape and sexual assault. And though that tends to uh, elicit very low numbers because it makes the respondent think that they had to be criminally assaulted or something very severe in order for them to answer yes. Um, whereas other campus climate surveys, they ask like, did anyone like, touch you without your consent or try to do anything to you without your consent. Uh, the thing about his criticism is it's right, but for the BYU campus climate survey, it didn't ask anything about consent. It just asked, have you experienced any unwanted sexual contact within the last 12 months? And this, this is very unpopular, but it's true, but it's perfectly possible for sexual contact to be both unwanted and consensual. Uh, that's one of the limitations of the concepts of consent is um, that a person can engage in unwanted sexual contact, but it can be consensual. And this is actually evidenced by the fact that when you asked the, the, the students that answered yes to, have you experienced any unwanted sexual contact within the last 12 months? When you asked them what type of coercion was um, enacted by the perpetrator, uh, it was only like a significant portion of it was, was verbal pressure which is, is concerning, but it's not, it doesn't, it wouldn't count as sex, uh, sexual assault. In fact, let me, uh, let me go over the, uh, the results here. So if, if I'm understanding you right, what you're saying is that there's, there's a category of non-consensual where you say, no, you can't. It's like, I, I'm, I'm clearly and firmly saying no. Then there's a different category of um, whether or not it is wanted. And then there's an in-between where it can be both unwanted and still someone says it's okay, but they didn't want it to happen. They felt right, like, they felt and, and, it, and yeah. that does, by the way, and I, I wanna state this, um, I'm probably gonna put a disclaimer at the beginning of this episode that says like, hey, this is gonna be heavy. We're talking about hard things. We're probably not gonna talk about everything perfectly. We're trying to get to the bottom of this and, and have have important conversations imperfectly but well. Um, I can imagine people being really upset at what you just said about that third definition but the reality is, as, as a criminologist, like that's a category that people are going to need to be able to talk about thoughtfully and rationally and say, okay, this is hard. But like, yeah, if you're if you're a, a, a bad person who wants to who wants to get away with something, easiest way in the world is to is to get some kind of barely borderline consent and then claim, well, it's not my fault, right? Because I got consent, even though it's clear that the other person doesn't want it. And and in fact, if anything, like that. That gives me some fire when I talk to, to my kids and when I talk to students like, hey, if you don't want it, then you say no and you say it firmly. You don't need to apologize for that. Don't allow yourself to get pressure. And I think that's a good message to take to people. But that is in a different category than somebody for whom it was both unwanted and non-consensual. Is that is, is that a fair summation? Yeah. I mean, in an extreme example, you have like uh, young girls who engage in survival sex uh, in, in prostitution and they ne don't necessarily want it. The, the contact is unwanted, but it's consensual uh, because they feel like they have to do that in order to survive. Uh, another example would be like just in a, in a regular relationship where um, the, the one one partner says yes, even though they don't want to because they just want to make their partner happy. Um, and that, that can be unhealthy at times, but it's not sexual assault. Um, the, there's a part in the, in, this, in the survey where it says uh, the methods of coercion used by perpetrators most frequently were 
showing criticism, displeasure, or anger. That made up 37% of incidents. And then there was lying and threatening to end the relationship or constant verbal pressure, which made up 31% of all the incidents. And then using force, which made up 30% of the incidents. Um, and so the thing is, is that in other campus climate surveys, it sh they show that like one in four, one in five women actually experience sexual assault, some type of forcible sexual assault. Whereas this survey, it actually is biased to kind of get people to over-report or say yes, because it's just simply asking about unwantedness. And some of those, they, they wouldn't fall under sexual assault. They're still unhealthy. Like they're not okay. Like threatening to end the relationship because a person won't, won't uh, engage with you. Like that's not okay, but it's not criminal. That's not sexual assault. And it wouldn't fall in line with the definitions of sexual assault on other campus climate surveys. That's, that's, that's good to know. And that's, that's good defining of different terms that mean different things. Well, and I, and I will say too, you know, my experience has been that most Latter-day Saints are good and innocent folks and, you know, don't, this, this is not something that they have on their radar. And I think it's good that we have more discussions about how to keep yourself safe, but that too, that innocence, I think is also a good reason why you might have some underreporting. Yes. We're going to get into that in a minute, but also potentially like, some overreporting and like, hey, overreporting, yes. And so, mm -hmm. like, there's, there's, there's both sides to that. And the reason why I bring that up is because the one criticism is that because of these deficiencies in the survey, it would lead to underreporting of sexual assault. But in this case, it actually led to overreporting. And the fact that you know only seven point four percent answered in the affirmative to experiencing unwanted sexual contact. That's already lower than other universities. But once you take into account that most of them, like a good chunk of them aren't sexual assault, that even makes the rates even lower compared That's to other universities. Way. Yeah. Okay, and, so, so let me let me see if I can I can phrase it this way, because I got into a, a fight with a friend of mine the other day about, <laughs> um, we were talking about instruction because I'm an educator and he said, well, but I, I'm not sure that I trust those studies. And I said, well, do you have studies that you trust? He said, no, all those statisticians. I said, so just so we're clear, that's fine. But what you are saying is that you disagree with all of the evidence we have. He said, well, yeah, but the evidence is kind of, and I said, yeah, that's fine. Like we can get into the, the, the problematic issues of the evidence in a minute, but you have no evidence and I have some and it's imperfect. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that, but you are taking your stance as against every piece of evidence that we have. You have a way to dismiss everything that, that we have and say, no, I don't agree with it. And I, I think that's, you know, I, I don't think that, um, how, how do I say this? I think campus surveys are good and useful. I think they are not enough. I think they absolutely suffer from problems. Nobody is disagreeing with that. We'll get into um, over, over and under reporting in a minute because I think there is some legitimacy to that. At the same time, by every possible metric I've been able to find, BYU and the school that I work at, BYU-Idaho, are among the safest campuses you can find in the United States of America. Um, yes. And for good reason, like this is not just, my personal opinion, I've looked at all of the subjective ratings. So if you look at like niche.com and like all of these weird, like random college scorings where they'll, they'll, they'll do these surveys. When I look at FBI crime statistics, like just in the area of Provo and Orem, Utah, or in the area of Rexburg, which is not perfect, right? It's not a perfect proxy. You still see a really clear breakdown of like, okay, these are really safe as compared to other college towns, like per capita. So mm -hmm. like, I don't see the data that suggests this narrative that somehow BYU and BYU-Idaho are like deeply unsafe. What I would rather say is until we get to zero, when we have zero sexual assault, I'll be happy. And we're not there. And I'm, I'm the first to say that, right? I have had to walk students to the Title IX office. I never want to have to do that ever again. Until we get there, I won't be satisfied. It is also not accurate to say that BYU and BYU-Idaho are somehow wildly off the mark when it comes to you know campus assault and safety and all of that stuff, I, I just don't think that's reflected in the empirical data. Right, and and also the if the the critics on Twitter are have a problem with screener questions, if you go down the survey, it asks all students about if they have experienced any type of a stalking behaviors from someone or if they've experienced domestic violence. And in those where they, they didn't ask a screener question, they asked behaviorally specific questions that can go over their answers here. Um, it says between four and 8% of survey participants experience very stalking related behaviors. Uh, that's extremely low. If you look at other 
other surveys in the general population and on other surveys. Um, like for example, uh, have you ever been in a relationship that was controlling or abusive? 8% of women said yes. That's much lower than what other women experience. Um, and then uh, dating violence. It asked in the past 12 months, a dating domestic partner has pushed, grabbed, or shaken me. Only 3% of women said yes. 2% of men said yes. Have they hit me, kicked me, slapped me, or beaten me up? Only 1% of women at BYU said yes. And have they threatened to hurt me? And I thought I might really get hurt. Only 1% of women said yes. And this was asked of the entire student body. Another thing to note is that this, this uh, survey, there were 13, about 13,000 students that answered all the questions uh, with a 42% response rate, which is much higher than at other universities. So that's another thing that ha it has going for it. Well, not only is it higher, but you know, I, I, not a sociologist, so somebody can correct me if this isn't the case, but my experience with RateMyProfessors.com is that, that if you leave everything to the optional, the people who report are the people who say everything is wonderful and great, and the people who say, I had a terrible experience, this was awful, this was garbage, right? Those are the, you, you get a very, um, bipolar is the wrong word, but now I can't think of the, the right word, like a very, you know, uh, not uniform distribution, I guess, is what I would say, right? Like there, there, are, there are two modes. Um, and I think that's part of it too, is like, you know, if I, if I see the culture and climate survey, I'm going to, uh, I could see it being biased in the direction of people who say I had a real, I had a really bad experience. And I think that mm -hmm. that's what you say. Uh, yeah. My guess is that was probably the case, not just at the BYUs. Yes. The, in the review I cited, um, they, their, their main concern with non-response bias was that the people who had been sexually assaulted would be more likely to answer. And in most of those surveys, it's like sometimes 18% uh, to about 30% of students that answer uh, the survey. So when you see 42% at BYU, you're, you have a pretty good uh, idea that, you, uh, a pretty good sense that it's, it's representative of the student body as a whole. It'd be better if 100% of them did, but that's, that's not the case in any survey. And just so we're clear, the survey's anonymous. So <laughs> people are, there's always, let's let's get into the underreporting issue. That, and by the way, I think that there is some legitimacy to this. Um, in, a, in a very conservative campus, um, and in the past, there have been rules that said, hey, if you come forward and you're out drinking, which is a violation as one example, right? If you're violating the honor code and you're drinking, and then during the course of that night, you're also assaulted, if you go to the honor code to report the other person, you could get disciplined as well. That has since changed. And now there's an amnesty policy, at least at BYU. I don't actually know what the policy is here. I suspect it's the same. Um, but there's an amnesty policy now at BYU that says, it doesn't matter what you were doing. If you're assaulted, then you are you get amnesty, but the other person can still be gotten in trouble and, and, and stuff like that. The reason yes. behind that change was there was there was it, it, it got caught on in the media. Salt Lake Tribune reported on it extensively, Peggy Fletcher Stack. And by the way, I'm not sure that that was a bad change. Like I, I, I have not looked at the empirical validity of moving that different. On a base gut level, I go, yeah, okay, I, I can be very good with that. That makes sense to me. Um, but I'm not, I, you know, I haven't. I also haven't done a program review. I'm not. I'm not making an empirical case for or against, right? Um, but looking at all of this stuff, the 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 way that I've heard it attacked is BYU only gets good scores on this because people are afraid to report. People are afraid to go to Title IX. They're afraid to go to the Honor Code office. They'll get kicked out. Um, there's there's a culture of fear and 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 that kind of stuff. Um, I, I take issue with that for a couple of reasons. One of them just, you know, all of the reasons that you've talked about with the over, you know, it is likely more biased in the direction of over-reporting for a number of reasons that we've already talked about. Um, the second one is, honestly, I think people are just smarter than that. I think students know that they can report anonymously and they won't get in trouble. Um, I also, it just was my experience, right? Like I went to BYU, I teach at BYU-Idaho. There are problems. No one is trying to say that there aren't. And I can imagine that if you've been through something awful, that a podcast like this is going to feel incredibly minimizing to you because we are describing statistical averages across a campus that is very, very large. But it doesn't change the fact that the average, the, that, that statistical average is simply different at the church schools than it is in other places. And that's an okay thing to talk about. Correct. And I've encountered that talking point as well. And my rebuttal is that that shows that BYU has done a bad job at dealing with specific cases. But, but critics have, have really tried to take that and try to show like, this bad thing happened or a few bad things happened at BYU. Therefore, is it logical to assume that, oh, this is a much bigger problem at BYU? 
um, on page 12 of the uh, campus climate survey, it asks the people who experienced unwanted sexual contact why they did not report to the Title IX office. Uh, this isn't the same as asking them, like ascertaining uh, why they wouldn't report on an anonymous survey, but it could give us an idea of why they wouldn't want to report to authorities. Um, and it, it said that, um, let me get there, Stud the, the most common one was that students did not think the incident was serious enough. That made up 31%. Uh, they did not want or need help, or they did not want the organization to take any action. That made up 24%. 11% uh, was for other reasons that they, they did not disclose. And here's the, the important one. It says they were not, they were worried about honor code discipline or their ecclesiastical endorsement being questioned. That only made up 9%. Um, or they were worried that they would be blamed for what happened. That made up another 9%. Uh, they had concerns about confidentiality, 7%. Um, or they were worried about possible retaliation, which is about 3%. So that, that didn't make up, uh, like they, they didn't trust the university, that didn't make up a significant uh, proportion of why they wouldn't report to the Title IX office or to the police or something like that. Uh, if we want to look at the, all the respondents um, and what they think about how BYU uh, handles these cases, at the very beginning, um, it compared you know, how the general student body felt about BYU, the, the safety of the campus, and then it compared how the people who experienced unwanted sexual contact, how they felt about the general atmosphere at BYU. And while the people who experienced unwanted sexual contact certainly were less likely to say, you know, I feel safe at BYU, their answers weren't that much different from the general student body as to how the safe they felt on the campus. Uh, they asked several questions like, I feel safe when I'm at B BYU campus. I'm ha happy to be a BYU student. I feel valued as an individual at BYU. I feel like I'm a part of BYU. I feel close to people at BYU. And I believe there is a clear sense of appropriate and inappropriate behavior among BYU students. Um, the people who experienced unwanted sexual contact, their, their answers were a little bit more negative than the general student body, but they were pretty similar as well. And so we, we get a general sense that the students, even the ones that have experienced unwanted sexual contact, trust their university to handle these things properly. Okay, so I, I now feels like one of those uh, but of course statements that we need to make. Um, a friend of mine talks about this in journalism where you're writing something on a, on a sensitive topic and you feel like you have to say, well, yeah, but of course, like, why should I have to write that in the article? Like, of course, you know, <laughs> that I don't want to kick puppies or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I want to say two or three things on this. Um, we already talked about this a little bit, but like I take the stance of let the chips fall where they may. Um, I, I believe in the church. I believe I love the CES institutions. They've benefited me personally. I have a, such a fantastic experience with them. But the best apologia that I can muster is just telling the truth about how it's going. And if we were doing poorly, at, we, and I'm sure we are at some things, let's talk about that and let's get it out there. In this case, I don't think that that's a fair statement. I think that, that we are doing a very good job. Um, and number two, like I said before, if you are the victim of something like this, um, that I don't know that this podcast is going to give you anything helpful. Um, the, the goal of this is to ask questions about policy and what we can learn and how we can do things like that. Um, at the same time, I hope that we're, you know, in our conversation, validating and thoughtful and, and trying to be reasonable. Um, but the third right. thing that I... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And uh, I tell people like that when I'm talking to critics and I've talked to a lot is like, it, it could be true that BYU does a, a bad, has done a bad job and maybe currently does a bad job at handling these cases when they happen. But these cases just like the data shows that they don't happen very often, at least compared to other universities. And that's important to note. Because so the distinction yeah. is that, that it could be that if, if your frustration is BYU handle these, handles these terribly when they pop up, that, that, we are not disagreeing with that empirically because we don't have that data. The data that we have says that these events happen a lot less regularly than on other college campuses. Yeah, and, and even I would challenge I, um, that BYU is worse than other universities at handling these cases. It could be. I just don't see very compelling evidence for it. I mean, there's stories of other universities handling mishandling these cases, and I go over that in my article. Like There, there are w women who have they don't want to report because they feel like they're going to be blamed. Like victim blaming isn't unique to the church. 
what I think is that even, even critics or ex, ex-Mormons, they implicitly hold the church to a higher standard. Uh, they hold religion to a higher standard. So when religion messes up, it's more likely to get noticed in the media. And so it creates this illusion that it happens more often than it does. And so I think the, the main effect that the church has on these cases is it changes the way that they're expressed. Rather than a girl at uh, a state university uh, having her case mishandled by the Title IX office or by administrators, it's being mishandled by bishops, people who are supposed to be, uh, supposed to be like really good people that are supposed to be representatives of Christ. It's being mishandled by a church university who is supposed to be living up to, to Christ-like standards. And so when that happens, and it happens enough, and the media reports on it enough, it creates this illusion that it happens more often than it does. That's how I apologize to science. No, I, I think that's, uh, well, it's, the example I give is you, your kid is probably safer than, with, with a Catholic priest than with a high school gym coach. And I think that the numbers bear me out on that. And that, that's a really uncomfortable thing to say. But like, again, people just haven't looked at the statistics and it's this issue of, well, they should be safe with, yes, they should be, but they should be safe with all adults, right? Like, um, and I, I think it's just that, that kind of a thing where I, I think you're right, that there's a different standard. And by the way, I'm good with that higher standard. I want that higher standard. Me too. I, I think I will be happy when the church universities are at zero percent assault, right? When everybody says it's hunky dory and everybody everybody feels good and safe and there are no problems. There's a third thing though here, which is the purpose of your article was not to run defense for BYU. The purpose of your article was not to be an apologist. It was not to say BYU is great; it has no problems. The purpose of your article was say was to say actually there are things we can learn from the BYUs because they are getting something right. If you look at the data, they are outliers. Right. By the way, I would argue that that's that's the case in a number of different ways. BYU Idaho is is an outlier in terms of the cost that it that that it you know that to students and 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 a whole lot of other stuff. I think there are some really cool things going on. The goal of this is not to say we're amazing, we're perfect, or anything else. It might be to say, hey, you other universities could step it up and protect some people. You might actually be able to do some good in your sphere. So you mentioned earlier about these other protective factors. What are the big ones? And if you if you were suddenly tomorrow, you know, the chancellor of the UC system in California, you know, what would you do? What, how would you how would you make the UC system a little bit more like BYU? If your goal, let's say that your only goal is to reduce sexual assault, what are the things that you do? Yeah, well, the, there's factors that the CDC lists that are risk factors for increasing uh, sexual assault uh, among individuals, and there are community risk factors. Uh, the main one is alcohol. And you don't have to be LDS to not drink alcohol. It's just that that being LDS provides these specific motivators to not drink it. Um, and so I, I cited several reviews of the literature by the RAND Corporation showing that it makes uh, potential perpetrators more likely to perpetrate and it makes uh, victims more likely to be victimized. Uh, that's not victim blaming, that's just drawing a cause and effects relationship between the two. And so if you, if you want to prevent yourself from being victimized, here are some things that you can avoid going to, to parties, avoid the party culture at, at universities. I also cited a, uh, a study which went over panel data showing that when these big parties happened at, at several universities, that young girls were more likely to be sexually assaulted during those time periods. They're more likely to, to report sexual assault to the police. The, I think the alcohol is the main one. Um, I also listed, however, uh, living a chaste life. Um, the BYU has several rules uh, that you, one, that you can't like be in a person's bedroom. And there, there's a theory within criminology called routine activities theory. And it basically argues that in order for a crime to happen, you need to have a motivated offender, a vulnerable victim, and then an absence of capable guardians to protect the victim. And I, I think that BYU's rules, they make it, they put a lot of barriers in place for a potential perpetrator to get what they want. Like you're not allowed to go into a person's bedroom. Um, that make that makes it much more likely that if um, uh, a young man and a young woman are together, that they're going to be in the living room where other people are. Uh, so if they if they were to go back in in her bedroom or his bedroom, uh, they're more likely to be alone. And even if the young girl wasn't planning on on doing anything with the young man, 
she's much more vulnerable to, uh, and that she's much more likely to be taken advantage of. Um, the one of the risk factors, uh, several of the risk factors listed by the CEC. Let's see if I can get to those. By the way, you're is, welcome to share your screen if you'd like. Right. That, uh, I'll just read them off right here. But it says that individual risk factors are alcohol and drug abuse. We already went over that. That Latter Day Saints have much lower alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, delinquency. Their Latter Day Saints have been shown to be low on that. Um, early sexual initiation. Um, a preference for impersonal sex and sexual risk taking. Um, there is plenty of data showing the young Latter Day Saints they have much later age of sexual initiation and. They don't engage in casual or impersonal sex nearly as often as other youth do, even compared to other religious youth. Uh, once you control for a bunch of other factors like uh, religious salience and church attendance, those differences go away. But it does show that the church does a better job at getting their youth to, to follow the law of chastity. Uh, there's, a, there's a great book by Mark Regneris. He's a sociologist that has studied this called The Forbidden Fruit. And he actually goes over like different denominations, kids with uh, youth with no religion and compares their sexual activity and shows that the Latter-day Saints perform pretty well on these. And so do other religious youth for that matter. I, I guess my question, and, and this is, again, I how do I say this? My goal here is not to beat the drum in favor of BYU, but if your only goal is to end sexual assault, I don't understand why people aren't beating the drum at the University of Utah and saying, get rid of alcohol. You can do it tomorrow. Go to Berkeley and be like, hey, end alcohol. You know that that's part of the problem. Why aren't the presidents of universities doing that? Nobody is outraged over that. And again, I'm not, I, the, I don't want that to become a case of whataboutism. If BYU's got issues, let's solve them. Let's hit them directly and head on if they mishandle a case. All of that, that's fine. Let's do that. But the whole point of your article is there are things we know that work and we can do them, but we just don't seem to be willing to it at, at some universities. Right. They're, they're willing to promote uh, consent education whose evidence is, is very, very weak. But like take take BYU and Latter-day Saint religion out of this. And we have all these risk factors that Latter-day Saints perform really well on, where if you can reduce those, then you you're, you're going to reduce sexual assaults. If uh, but it's just not people are are proposing solutions that are more in line with their identity politics and then with things that work. Like it's very unpopular to, to decry alcohol. Anytime I make a post on Facebook about alcohol, those are the most comments that I get. Most negative comments I ever get from my friends on Facebook is when I say, Hey, here's some data showing that alcohol is bad <laughs> and the people just don't like it. And uh, porn as well, like exposure to sexually ex uh, explicit media. That's another risk factor that the CDC lists. Um, that's not a very popular one to go against either. Um, and, and so if you see like a, a, a college administrator, a university administrator decrying all those things, I mean, he's going to be seen as just like a, a prude, basically. And so it's just not politically feasible, well, not feasible, but just not politically popular to, to talk about these things. So I'm, I'm looking, I'm going to share my screen just for a second. You'll be able to see all my too many tabs and all that stuff. Um, let's see, is this the right one? Uh, this was striking to me. I'm just looking here at the, the California statistics on this. Um, it sure doesn't appear to be getting better in the last five years, right? Like in the last 10 years. Right. And we no. th this is this is like and, and again, I, I'm only just looking at this and I'm not a sociologist and sometimes numbers play tricks on you. But if I'm understanding this right, this is let's see, this is FBI. This is FBI data. And we're talking about the rate of incidents from it per 100,000. And it's gone from about 26, 27 to almost 39 from in, in the last 10 years, like almost a doubling of the incidence of, of uh, California rape statistics in the just the last 10 years. That to me seems like cause for real serious alarm. And I don't think that there's, I, I don't know, I, I feel like somebody should be saying, hey, something is crazy, something is going on. Let's have a conversation about how to improve things. 
Um, and if, you're, if your goal is to say, hey, consent works, hey, that's awesome. Show me the data. Because nothing would make me happier than a really simple programmer that we can roll out where we basically teach people a very, very basic concept. And all of a sudden we snap our fingers and magic happens. Yeah, well, it, it's not because of a lack of consent education, because, I mean, we're talking about California. They're, they, they're all for that. I'm sure they're implementing that all over in, in universities and in schools and, and among even young kids. And so, I mean, that's that's just like a, a bivariate, like just like we're, we're seeing a very liberal state that likely likes to implement these programs and we're not seeing rape go down. That's very concerning. Um, I'd like to also go over the, the data source that I shared about BYU-Idaho because um, they don't have a campus climate survey. Uh, they just sh showed like how many cases have been reported to the police. Um, I was critiqued on that for Twitter for, for citing that as well, because like he said, he, he says that that sexual assault is underreported, but he's sharing like police statistics. Now what's up with that? Um, the underreporting issue is more important when you're trying to ascertain what the actual like number or rate is within a university or, or within a certain population. Um, what I was trying to do is compare and you don't have to know the actual rate in order to compare um, different rates at different universities or different precincts. So if you have a data source that, and you have another data source and they have similar limitations to them, even if they don't actually measure the, the real number of sexual assaults that are happening, they're still useful for comparing. Like for example, you can use uh, crimes reported to the police or arrests that were made for a certain crime and you can track them like fluctuations in crime over time, even though they don't actually measure the actual number of robberies uh, that happened during that year, you can still use it to track the, the rate so, over time. So let me just make sure that I'm understanding that. It, it, so for example, let's say that we have a bias number, but it's bi biased in the, I don't know, downwards direction, right? Mm -hmm. So we're only, they report 20 robberies, but they're actually 40 robberies on campus that year. Well, that's fine. It's going to stay biased in the same direction for the next year. So you can use it to compare over time and you can use it across campuses unless there's something uniquely special about one campus. Right. And, and BYU-Idaho, like they only reported like two, uh, two sexual assaults to the police. And I'm sure there were more that that happened. Like uh, there, there's definitely more sexual assaults that happened at BYU-Idaho. BYU but if you compare data sources from other universities, which is what that source does, if you actually look at it and read it, um, to have the same limitations, you know, sexual assault reported to the police, then we can be relatively certain that the comparison is accurate unless you can show that BYU-Idaho has a reporting practice that would cause them to underreport, um, which I don't, I haven't seen any evidence for that. Well, and again, I think what it does is it shifts the burden of proof. If your goal is to yeah. say BYU and BYU-Idaho are really, really bad at this, show me the data. And I, that, like, I have no horse in this race. That's completely fine. If that's the case, let's address it. Let's fix it. Let's do what we've got to do. I just don't see any evidence that this is the case. I was talking to a student of mine the other day and I, and, and she mentioned this kind of stuff. We were talking about assault and she said, yeah, I have a roommate who, who told me the other day that BYU Idaho is one of the worst in the nation. I said, oh, that's interesting. Where, where do you get that data? And she said, oh, I don't know. I think, I think she just has a friend that something happened to her. I said, hey, totally valid. Support that friend, do everything you can. I think that's very different from that it is one of the worst in the nation. That is a statement that is not backed by data. And I don't think it helps anybody. I think what it does help people is to say, this is not a perfect place. You need to know what to do in the case that something bad happens. You need to know what to do to protect yourself. Um, again, you, I think you said it really well. That's not about victim blaming. That's about preventing victimization, right? The goal is to say, hey, any preventative factor that you can take is a good thing. And we should all do as many of those as we can. If something happens that is not on you, that's on the perpetrator and they should get punished for it. All right. Um, and, and, and the argument I make in my article is that like, is it, is it victim blaming to tell people to lock their doors in order to avoid being burglarized? Like, no, absolutely not. That's just telling them to take precautions. And so at the end of the day, the only person that's responsible for abuse is the abuser. But there are still some precautions and, and, and safety measures that you can take to help protect yourself. And we, we know that there is a cause and effect relationship between certain risk factors and sexual assault. And if you reduce those risk factors within a population, you will lower sexual assaults. Well, I, I, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. It's been really helpful. 
Um, I, I have to admit, I, w I, w I was not with the, a few years ago when when uh, the the BYU reporting happened. Um, I wasn't upset about the policy change. I think the policy change was probably good, and it was it was probably a good move. And I'm glad that um, that maybe something positive came from it. I, again, I also don't understand things deeply. I didn't work in that office. Like I, don't, you know, I'm not not trying to render a judgment on that. I didn't mind if BYU came out looking bad if they were doing something uniquely bad. Um, what bothered me was that it was pretty obvious in my mind that there are a whole lot of schools. You know, I, I always talk about the University of Utah because it's right next to my house where I was growing when I was growing up. And I think University of Utah is a good school. I think it's a great school. But I have a problem with the idea that we would go down to BYU and look under a microscope and completely ignore the University of Utah and pretend that that's totally OK and totally acceptable when BYU is doing everything that it, it can think of. And, and, and again, if there are problems, let's fix them. Um, but the University of Utah gets much less coverage um, and has significantly higher rates by all the data that we have. Again, yep. the, the point here is not to say that um, the data is perfect, but I know of no data that interrupts my story and says, actually, you're wrong. BYU does have it way worse. It's just in the secret source of data that nobody else knows about. Like, I, I just don't see those empirics. Yeah, I, I personally know inmates at the Utah prison who are in prison specifically because they were serial rapists of, of college women at the University of Utah. I know of no comparison at BYU. I have not. There, there are instances of some BYU professor who sexually assaulted a student. But I, the, the specific inmate that I'm thinking of, I know of no comparison at BYU. And there's, there's, there is no comparison because BYU does a better job. And I'm not being apologist for BYU, but just here are some here are some criteria that you can meet that BYU does that other universities can do to reduce sexual assault if they actually cared about doing that. So maybe let's end on this on this point. So this has been a, a hard hitting conversation. I've I've appreciated it. I've enjoyed it. Um, I I want to ask what are the things that people can do? We've talked about what a campus can do, but what are the protective factors that people can take? And again, the the idea here is. Um, I, I don't want anybody feeling blamed, right? I, I, I think that that's the absolute wrong way to go. I also think it's good to create a culture in which we do everything in our power to prevent this stuff from happening. Um, and that means having conversations about what, what can the individual do at the individual level? Um, what can people do if they know somebody who, who is in trouble or who has gone through something really hard? Um, and, and I have a couple of things that I know, and it's not much because my, my job is not to be an expert. My job is to pass somebody off to an expert and make sure that they, you know, that they get connected in the right way. But um, what are those kinds of things that, that on the individual level people can do? Well, I would say that trying to reduce uh, your own personal pornography consumption, if you struggle with that, would be a, a good a choice to make. Um, the, the thing is, is that I've, I've seen arguments in the literature about that uh, pornography only only affects people, it only makes them more likely to sexually assault if they are at risk. They have certain uh, risk factors, like uh, they're, they're abused as children or they uh, certain genetic risk factors that make them more likely to be sexually aggressive or something like that. But the thing is, is that those people aren't gonna be exposed to pornography. They're less, much less likely to be exposed to it if their parents don't view it, if their friends don't view it. And so even if you aren't an at-risk person, you can contribute to, to creating a culture where that's just not okay. And so people who are at risk of sexual being, uh, being abusers are less likely to um, be exposed to pornography at a young age because people around them aren't viewing it. I love that I asked a question about how to keep yourself safe. And you said, well, potential offenders can fix it by doing this and this and this. I think that that was spot on and I appreciate that. Um, it's interesting because that's another one. I, <laughs> we talk about cognitive biases and logical fallacies a lot um, in some of my classes, and I've tried to help my students see that we, we're all subject to these, right? We we have narratives and we want to hold on to them, and there's confirmation bias, and there's you know there's all sorts of biases. One of the simplest ones that I feel like we never talk about is what I'm going to call guilt bias, right? If I say that coffee is bad for you and you drink coffee, you're going to get really really upset. And you're not going to want to listen to the data. If I say video games are really bad for you and you play lots of video games, this is me. I'm talking about me here. I like video games, right? You're going to be more, more likely to dismiss those things. When you're talking about alcohol and pornography just a minute ago, it's like, this is exactly in line with what we would think. Right now, I'm fighting a battle with some of my friends over, over social media. Look, I don't think that if, you watch, if, you, if you're on social media, you're going to turn into an axe murderer. But I also think that if you look at the numbers, like, yeah, we... we 
this is fairly new because we, we, we don't have longitudinal studies of 30 years. If you're gonna wait that long, you're gonna have to wait until your kids are all grown up and we're, we're doing experiments on kids, right? The reality is that there's some real data out there and it's not encouraging. It seems really, really dangerous and problematic. And I think, I think that we can say yes in perfect data, but maybe there's some things we should respond to. Um, and it keeps me up at night that because of this, you know, I, I'm, I'm making up this term, but guilt bias, I'm not saying that you, you feel guilty that you drink. I'm saying that because you drink, you're unwilling to look at the policy impacts with rational eyes. And, and you're not willing to look at it and say, okay, but if we got rid of alcohol, but take me out of it for a minute, would that make the world a better place? And I, listen, I, I don't think that this is the, the overwhelming data support that that would make the world a much, much safer place. I would love to run that experiment. Let's Let's try that policy proposal, right? Give me three schools, three big universities, and let's say, hey, tomorrow we're going dry. If you don't like that, you'll have to find somewhere else. Our goal is to, we are serious about, re about reducing sexual assault on campus. I, I think it could do a world of good. And hey, if it doesn't work, then I'll shut up about it and I won't keep bringing it up. But I don't think that's the case. I think we could solve a lot of the problems tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. And the, the, the criminological literature shows that alcohol is the most criminogenic drug out of all of them. Um, not it's not necessarily by itself the most dangerous compared to like meth or, or cocaine but because it is so it's legal and it's so widespread it, the, its impacts upon crime upon drunk driving sexual assault domestic abuse is, is huge and so if we, if we were to get rid of alcohol or pass laws that would significantly reduce alcohol consumption um yeah we would solve a lot of problems in, including sexual assault but other other problems as well well, and I, I think that's that's a good note to end on. As I look back on my experience at BYU and, and now at BYU Idaho, like I said, it's not perfect. I know that there are people who are um, getting into some trouble and there are some some men in particular, but um, who need to sort some stuff out. And I, I look, I I'd love to I'd love to be much more direct to the to the the, the people that are that are potential, you know. I don't know what to call this, but potential victimizers in the future, right? Potential potential assaulters. Let's get that straight. Let's let's have those hard conversations. Let's do everything we can to prevent this. And one of the best things that the the, the nation could do is learn some lessons from some places that are getting it right. And 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 you know, I'm always reminded of of Jesus in the New Testament when he says, "Hey, God is able to make of these stones children of Abraham." Right? I, I don't think it's because we are Latter-day Saints, we're magically protected in all ways and we get everything right or, or, or we're superior. These are specific behavioral practices, right? And these are things that other people can do and it can protect them too. Um, and to the extent that we have benefited, it's because we've tried to, to live according to some things that we really believe in. I, I loved your part about chastity and how it gives context to sexuality and there, there's a reason for it. Right now, do, do I think that that solves all problems? No, obviously not. We still have some sexual assault. Um, but it goes a lot deeper than just reducing the statistic. It's I, I think you've made a really good case for the qualitative differences between assault on different campuses. So, um, well, I'll give you the last word. Is there anything else that you want to add really quick? And also, where can people find you if they like your your thoughts, your writing, your ideas? Where where can they follow you? Well, I had a TikTok channel. Um, I haven't made anything in a while. Uh, I'm thinking of going back on it. Just it takes up too much of my time. Uh, it's called Your Resident Crime Fighter. Um, on TikTok, I have about 600 followers. Uh, I show up on Jacob Hansen's channel every once in a while. I did a debate on Mormonism and mental health on there. Um, I have a Substack, jacobmayberry.substack.com that I contribute to. Um, you can also find me on Facebook, but I think those are the, the main sources that you can find me on. I don't have a huge platform. Uh, I've just started writing about this stuff, but I'm hoping to do it a little more often. Well, I have loved everything that you've said, and I, I appreciate it. And like I said, by, by the way, I, I should I should say this too before we wrap up. If you disagree with everything that we've said today, that's completely fine, right? I, I think it's fair to say that we take a more conservative stance on this, right? Politically conservative even, right? And I, I think that's totally valid, right? If you disagree with us, that's fine. Bring the data, bring the receipts. Let's have this discussion. The one, one of the primary reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is um, when you see an article get dragged, you, you have to kind of step back and say, okay, but was there a reason this got just dragged or was this just a way to try to shame people away from having the conversation? Um, and there are times when I've said something and I go, oh yeah, ooh, I didn't think about that. I, I gotta, I gotta retract that, right? Like I gotta, I gotta back off or I gotta change something. And I think that's good. I think it's healthy to admit mistakes. But when somebody called for you to retract your article, um, or for public square to retract, retract your article, I remember thinking that means this needs to be talked about more, not less. We need to learn to talk about this more, not less. And we need to learn how to disagree better on this topic. 
And if that makes people frustrated, let it, let it make them frustrated. The goal of this is to, to improve things, not to blame, not to, not to escape blame when we get things wrong, as, as I'm sure that we will. Um, but I think that we have some chances to do some good by having these conversations. And, and like I said, if you disagree, let's have it, let's have it out. Let's discuss those things. Um, but it's essential to me that we have the conversation as best we know how. So Jacob, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a blast. Yeah, thank you. The goal of Radical Civility isn't to go viral. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. It's why we don't tell you to like, subscribe, or review. It's not that those things aren't important, by all means. It's just that we have a different philosophy. Our goal isn't to make money or become the next big thing. It's the leaven and the bread idea. A few dedicated people can make a big difference, and they can do it quietly. Like Civility Sleeper Ninjas or something. So while we won't turn you down on donations or, you know, liking and sharing and subscribing and all of that, that's not really what we're here for. The most important thing you can do to help the podcast is to be a civility ninja. Engage in a dialogue sometime instead of just an argument. Try listening to someone, really listening, especially someone you disagree with. Make an insight rather than just focusing on scoring rhetorical points. And when you do, use the Radical Civility hashtag to let us know that something we did made the world a little bit better. Now, if you insist on supporting our podcast in the traditional ways, that's okay. We won't complain. Like, subscribe, review, and donate if you can. Our Patreon page is patreon.com slash radical civility. More importantly, have a conversation with someone you know who might find value in a conversation like the one that we're trying to have. The best thing you can probably do for us is to point intelligent, thoughtful, kind-hearted people our way. In any event, thanks for listening. We hope you find this helpful.